Living Well to the Very End Measurement Webinar. And I'm Mike Davidge, and I'm with you for the next hour when we'll be exploring how you can use measurement to help you know how well your project's going. During the, uh, the webinar, there are three points when I'm going to invite you to pause the recording and discuss a simple task with your colleagues. So, when we get to that point, please, please do so, and the slide will indicate roughly how long I'm expecting you to, to spend. And then, when you're ready, you can press play again, and the recording will continue. So, what have we got in store? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that every system, including the one that you're working with right now, is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. That's according to Dr. Paul Batalden, and that's my experience too. Uh, when I work, we refer to this uh, colloquially as the, the first law of improvement. It isn't necessarily, but it's so important to recognize that if you don't like the outcomes that your current service is giving you, you're going to have to think about redesigning it. And how might we do that? Well, we are reminded by uh, W. Edwards Deming, one of the foremost uh, pioneers, really, of quality improvement in the late 20th century, that change will be required. And there's a process of change, just as there is for lots of other things. And it's how to change that's the particular problem. And we use a very simple framework for this. And here it is now appearing on the slide. It's three questions and a little graphic at the bottom underneath those questions. Plan, do, study, act, which I'll refer back to at the end of this webinar. So those three questions we're going to be looking at and trying to unpick what they actually mean and what do we actually have to do to make sure we've actually answered them. So let's crack on and look at that first question, what are we trying to to accomplish. And I, I call this perfecting your aim because what we're really trying to do here is take the problem that you want to solve and switch it round and say, well, we've got this problem, but what if we'd solve the problem? What would good look like? And the, the people that gave us this quite simple model for improvement of three questions and the plan, do, study, act cycle, they came up with some ideas about what might be in that aim statement. Because I'm going to get you in a while to try and write yours down. So what might be in it? They would say that features of a good aim statement include what you're wanting to Work on is worthwhile. Well, worthwhile for whom? Worthwhile clearly for your patients and users of your service. But it's also good if it aligns with what you as an organization are wanting to achieve too. The next bullet point in the list says outcome focused. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. What you aim to achieve needs to be measurable. And again, we will spend some time looking at that. And then it needs to be clear and specific. So a very clear boundary around what it is you're trying to improve. This is not about trying to eradicate world poverty. And some of the aim statements, I've seen at least the early versions of them, 
perhaps not quite that extreme, but are certainly far too broad and too vague. So be clear about the patient group, maybe, that you're thinking about working with. Be clear about what time scales you are working to, and be clear in the use of your language. So what shouldn't be in that AIM statement? Well, here's an example of what should not be in. And it's the clue is in that little two-letter word, by. What we're interested to know is we want to reduce the number of complaints. But notice that they haven't stopped there. They've included something else by giving our staff customer care training. So the natural question to ask would be, why have they put that in? Well, we've got to assume that they've done their the work understanding why people are complaining and have come to the conclusion that staff need training, in this case, customer care training. Well, we'll assume that that's right. But even if customer care training is worthwhile and certainly perhaps part of a solution, is that by itself, the training that is, going to get them where they want to be. Well, if you think back to the training you've been on over the years and the number of times you've returned back to work and put into practice everything you have learned in that training program, you'll know the answer is not necessarily. Training would be necessary, but it's not sufficient on its own. What we want to see, if we are to reduce the number of complaints, is that staff change their behaviour based on what they've learnt on that training programme. And the danger, by putting custom care training or any solution like that into your aim statement, is that the focus of your work becomes, in this case, on delivering the training. And you will tick that off as a successful project if you've delivered the training program. But remember, where did we start? We started with complaints. So that is our focus. Don't include solutions like training in your AIM statement. Keep them up your sleeve, you will need them later, but keep the AIM focused on the outcome that you want to see. And of course, the words we use can be very important too. This is one of my favourite phrases at the moment. It's weasel words. And weasel words are words that don't have a specific single meaning. They mean different things to different people. And I've put some weasel words on the bottom of this slide. And as you read them, you'll see that they are words that are commonly used to describe quality improvement. But we don't want them. We don't want them because it's very difficult to know what they actually mean. Words like effective mean different things to different people. And the difficulty we will then have is we can't easily measure them. So if you're struggling with knowing how to measure something, chances are you're using weasel words. So we've come to that first pause point. So what I'd like you to do is write down what you think the aim of your project is. And remember, no solutions and no weasel words. So take about up to three minutes for this. So hit pause now, and we'll talk again in a few minutes. Well, how did you do? Did you manage to avoid those weasel words? It's difficult, isn't it? 
And you may look at what you've written and decide, it's not very good, Mike. It needs to be improved. That's fine. Keep working on it and share it with your colleagues. Do they have the same idea as you? Are they on the same page or are they just slightly different? But now you've answered that first question, what are we trying to achieve? And we can move on to the next one. And I'm going to take them out of order. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to move on to the third question. Uh, by the way, the authors say you can answer these questions in any order. They don't have to be answered top down. What changes can we make that will result in improvement? Now, this is all about understanding what the problems are and what's causing those problems. Too often in the NHS, we're very quick to jump to solutions without first really understanding what the problems are. So let's do that. And I'm going to show you three fairly straightforward techniques that you can use to help you get underneath the surface to understand why things are happening as they are. And the first one is a very, very straightforward and simple to use tool. And in fact, as you can see from the graphic on that screen, some of you who either got young children now or had young children will have been in this situation. Five whys. Unfortunately, children don't stop at five. They keep going. You need to keep going until you identify the underlying process that has generated the problem. Let's take an example. Okay, so patients are not getting the information leaflet about the, the condition of the service. So why, why are they not receiving them? Well, we've run out of leaflets. Now, if you stop there, what you will do is simply say, right, go and order some more. In fact, order lots so we don't run out again. In fact, you end up ordering 20,000 of them just to make sure that you haven't run out. Instead of which, ask the question, why did we run out? And the answer may come back, well, actually, we forgot to order them, to reorder. OK, so why did we forget? Well, actually... Good question, because we've actually got no reliable reminder system in place. So, so in this case, I've simply why three times, and we've got to an underlying weakness that we don't have a reliable reminder system. So, focus of the work, let's build a reminder system so that we don't need to order 20,000. We order just enough, but we do it on a reliable basis. So that's five whys. It's very simple, very easy to use. It doesn't take you very long. It's going to take me a couple of minutes to do that. It might take you a little bit longer in a real situation, but it doesn't take long to get to where you need to. Let's take a slightly more complex example, but it's not that much more difficult to use. This is when you've got some data. And you've got some data about the reasons why things are not happening. The example on the graph there talks about issues rates of patients being discharged from the inpatient bed. And all the staff have done in their daily meetings is captured the reasons why patients were delayed. And they plotted them on a bar chart. The bar chart is ordered the most frequently occurring reason on the left. And then it goes in descending order across to the right. Those are the blue bars you can see. The line you can see here is a cumulative percentage of all of those. And that's used to help us understand if we tackled this many reasons, the first three bars, for example, that would get us to 50% of, of the issues that we, we are finding over this period. So just tackling three reasons gets us 50% of the delays. And that's why we use it. We're using it to display the number of times distinct things happen. In this case, uh, issues raised for discharge, but it could be reasons why patients fall, why they don't turn up, and so on. Or it could be the reasons why patients complain. 
And you're using this to help you understand where do we need to start working? Which of these reasons should we start with first? And you naturally, your eye gets drawn to the left-hand side of that diagram and you might say, right, let's tackle one of those. So that's Pareto and it's called Pareto after the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your issues will be due to 20% of the problems. And finally, we'll come to something I'm sure many of you have had a go at, which is process mapping. Mapping out the steps in the process as it currently happens. And ideally created by the people who operate that and interact with that process. The people who do the work know the work best. So you can certainly do that with your staff, with your colleagues, but you can also use your patient and carers, perhaps, to help you understand what it's like from their perspective. You're adding into the what actually happens to how do they feel at that stage. Now, you can see that particular graphic on the screen has got different post-its in different colours, and in particular, the, the pink ones there are used to, to, to highlight issues. And the, the, the post-it is put at the point in the pathway of the process where that issue occurs. And you can see right at the beginning on the left-hand side of that graphic, there's a, a half a dozen pink post-its at one stage, right early on, clearly indicating there's a lot of issues at the start of that particular process. So we've looked at, at that, the classic process map, but of course there are other ways of mapping out what actually happens. And some of you are already doing this, I know, walking the patient's journey. You get a sense of the distance and of the, uh, the ease with which you can navigate your way around. You can take that one stage further and actually shadow a patient. Now you're seeing the interaction of the patient with the staff along the way. You're seeing at what point do they get confused, do they might get lost, and so on and so on. Obviously, if you're shadowing the patient, it's good to get their permission. Otherwise, you could be said to be stalking. And finally, there's a, another way in which you can understand what's going on with the pathway this is particularly useful if you've got pathways that are very long, that take several days or weeks, or maybe cover a distance that you can't actually physically walk very easily. And that is to use the files and paper records to create uh, a little Gantt chart here. Uh, this Gantt chart has days across the top of the uh, table, and then what was actually happening to the patient down the rows. Each row represents something new that was actually done. And it's color coded. So the value added steps, the things that the patient actually would value having done for them are in green. There are some things that we need to do that are necessary, but the patient might not necessarily think that would help them but in fact we have to do it for all sorts of medical legal reasons and they're in uh, orange or yellow and then the red which there is quite a lot here is when nothing was actually happening at all for that patient and there's a lot of red on that diagram and you could go through that process and say at what point do we have issues with delays and so on so a number of ways in which you can understand how the work gets done so now we come to uh, another of those pause points. And I want you to think about whether you know what is causing the issues you've uncovered so far. Do you think you've got the full picture? Again, take no more than three minutes of this and talk about that. And maybe think about what you might need to go and do next. OK, hit pause and I'll speak to you again in a few moments. So, how did you do? Is there more diagnostic, investigative work you need to do 
to get underneath the surface to understand what's causing the issues you've got. We're on to that third question now. Second in the list. What's the measures question? How will we know that a change is an improvement? When we're thinking about data and measures, actually, there are two distinct types, and both are valid. So what I'm going to be talking about mostly the, the numbers, the quantitative data that we can collect about our service and about the way our patients are treated. But the words, the qualitative data, the data we're capturing from our patient stories, our interviews, or from our observations ourselves, are just as valid. In fact, what you want to be able to do is to put those two together to see whether they're telling you the same story. And while we're on the subject of stories, here's a little story for you. This graph tells the story of a very simple improvement project. This was about staff wanting to make sure that the patients who came into the medical admissions unit had had the medicines reconciliation task done well. They knew what medicines the patients should be on, including dosage and frequency and so on. Because patients admitted uh, to a, a, a unit such as this would be typically emergency patients wouldn't necessarily have all their drugs they got at home with them. So we need to know what they're on, what they should be on, to make sure that we're giving them the right drugs while they're with us. So what is this graph showing us? Well, on the bottom axis here, you can see that when we're talking about a time scale, so from April 20, 2007 to May 2008, the vertical scale at the left-hand side is the percentage of patients who had had that process, that reconciliation process, done properly according to uh, that they'd set out. The blue circles are the individual months that they collected data to say what proportion in that month. So in April, when they started, it was 35%. It dropped to 30% in May. It jumped to 50% in June. It stayed there, and then it drifted down again back to 35% in September, six months later. Whilst they were collecting that data, and they did that by looking at patients' notes, they noticed that the process was being done inconsistently. So one of the first ideas they had was, well, why don't we have a little form that is a, sets out the process that reminds us when we're doing this so we don't miss things out. They piloted the form, and whilst they were piloting the form, it just means testing whether the form design is right. It didn't have any impact on their performance. But as soon as they printed the form off and started using it in the October of 2007, you can see the impact they had. Some of you are probably thinking, mm, Mike, that's not much of a change. And you'd be right. Yes, the number we've got, 55%, is higher than we've seen before, but it's not a lot higher. Some of you may be saying, oh, yes, Mike, but at least it's consistent. I've got three months in a row now at the same number. We've not seen that before. So, yes, we've been We've introduced some consistency, but it's not perfect. I could ask you, like some, you're listening to a recording, so you won't be able to answer me where you'd want to be on this graph. And when I've done that in sessions before, I've had answers that range from 100 down to 90%. So about 90 to 100% bound right at the top here is where people want to be. And we can see that we're nowhere near that. So the team used the data. They were looking at that and said, oh, we've got this great idea. We've got the form. Thought that would have solved the problem. It hasn't. We need to do something else. OK. What they then went to was to say, well, the form's there. It's clearly not being used. So what we need to do is remind people to use it. 
And so what they did was they got they got somebody, their clinical director, to to write a, an email, probably, to say, remind, please remember to use the form. Now you can see from the graph that it didn't really have much impact. It's a slight jump in the the month that you now went back, but it's still tracked back to 55%. Clearly, getting people to try and remember is not a safe strategy. Why is that? Well, what they then did was ask the question they should have asked previously, not using it in an accusatory way. But why aren't they using it in an exploratory way? Let's understand why they're not using it. And of course, it was junior doctors who were primarily using that form. And as we all know, junior doctors are quite busy people and they get in, often interrupted, called away and so on. And clearly what was happening was they were not returning to do the task or, or, or just forgetting entirely. It wasn't their fault. It's just part of the system was designed to get them to deliver 55% medicines reconciliation most of the time. So the third chain made was to introduce pharmacy. Now, once pharmacy came and did a double check, you can see what's happening, 80%, 90%, and we're moving towards a system that works really well. Now, the point of showing you this graph, apart from to tell you the story, was to say this, that one graph, I've used to tell the story of the entire project. So the challenge you've got is what's the equivalent of this graph for you in your project? And that's what we're going on to look at now. We're going to look at how can you get the right data so that you can do something like this. And we need to think about the measurement process. And the measurement process is a little graphic on the left-hand side of that slide there. And you can see that we've already covered off the very first of those because that is deciding your reign. The next step is to choose measures. And so we're going to look at that right now. How do we know what to, to measure? Lots of questions, lots of choices. Well, let's give you a very simple framework to guide you with that, and here it is. I refer to this as systems thinking. It actually comes from a, uh, a paper and then subsequently several books by an American physician, Dr. Bedian, and you can see from the date that this is quite a long time ago. But he said, basically, if you want a, an outcome effect on the customer, you have to work back. It's about the process that takes place, the care plans, the protocols. And doing those requires some inputs, staff time and resources. Notice that it's not input straight to outcome. It's input through the process, through what we do that leads to the outcome. So it's both having resource and what that resource actually does that gets us the outcome we want. And when we're thinking about that then, we can start to think about the types of measure. Outcome measures show the impact on the patient. And we have expressed our aim statement and outcome, and so you're measuring directly your aim there, it'll be an outcome measure. But remember those changes. The changes I said you have to keep up your sleeve. Well, this is where we need them now. What we will be doing is trying to improve the process. I talked about reliable reminders for reordering patient leaflets. But there are lots of other processes that we, we do every day. How well do we do them? Hand hygiene is another one. And what we need then is a measure to say how good are we, or how bad are we, at doing what we say we should do. The final measure here is the balancing measure and that's there because whenever we make a change we're hoping it's going to have a positive impact on the area we're working on but sometimes those changes 
if we haven't done our work, homework right, has unintended consequences elsewhere. Uh, one of the favourite examples is, is uh, a project that was trying to uh, reduce length of stay in hospital. There they, they were quite pleased that they were actually discharging people more quickly. But what might be an unintended consequence of discharging people too quickly? I pause there for you to think, and I'm guessing some of you were saying, well, they might just come back again. Yes, missions are a problem. We don't, didn't intend to bring them back again. We actually thought we were discharging them for good. But if we don't do it in the right way, we don't tell community services they're coming. We actually discharge them too early in terms of their uh, recovery then they will simply bounce back. And so the readmission rate would be a measure here for a length of stay type project. We don't want, we're not expecting readmissions to go down, but we don't want them to go up. If they go up, it's an indication that we've not done our work properly and there is more still to do. Some of you, are using driver diagrams and for those of you who are the outcome measures will focus largely on the left hand side of your driver diagram the aim and the primary driver and your process measures will be a will be pretty much centered around the right hand side of your diagram around the changes that you are making if you're not using driver diagrams don't worry about that, but for those of you who are, which of your drivers and changes are you going to measure? You don't have to measure everything. You can't obviously sometimes measure everything. Which ones are you going to measure? Having thought about what we're measuring, tricky issue of defining what it is we're going to come to in terms of data. We need an operational definition very simple description steps to follow that is absolutely essential if you do these two steps you will get poor quality data and that's a prediction it's based on my experience that is what you'll have and you'll have wasted your time collecting data you cannot use so don't be there do think about this. I haven't got time now to, to get you to do this, but how might you define a fall? Well, a fall is until you start to try and think, well, actually, is that or isn't it? I asked uh, several groups recently to do quite similar but they're really struggling to actually get at what do we mean by a fall? To move from a higher to a lower level, typically rapidly and without control, was what one group came up with. And the second group said, so actually, it's not just about it, it's about unintentionally moving from a higher to a lower level, which may result in harm. And so they've introduced this idea of harm. So a fall for them may result in harm. Whereas the, the, the first group were just thinking about the, the, the physical action. And here are some questions if you are going down this particular task to actually try and define what a fall is. Does it have to be witnessed to count as a fall? And what about if you see patients about to fall or in the process of falling and catch them and lower them to the ground? Does that count or not? Many of you will have uh, incident reporting which talks about slips, trips and falls. Well, is there a difference? Are they the same or are they three very distinctive things? And all the same why have we got three words no more time to think about that now but you really need to spend some time working that out but keep it simple don't try and over complicate it but do come up with a definition for all the measures you're going to use and then collecting your data you will need 
some a plan actually to test whether you're getting the data you pay data about every patient or you sampling in that medicine reconciliation example they were sampling 20 patients a month that's perfectly okay you can see that they got to where they needed to get to just by taking 20 patients every month who's collecting it do they know what they collected do they know why they are collecting that data? when is it obtained is it real time or is it after the event retrospective time is much 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 better you get much more accurate data if you are recording it at the time whatever it isn't the difficulty of getting over things like uh, admission and particularly discharge times because the people who are tasked with recording that data are just not there when the patient is discharged and having to rely on other people or records or whatever to help them work out what it is it's no wonder it's unreliable if you're thinking about data that's Actually, where is it and how can you so have a plan and that plan needs to include getting a baseline here are three very different baselines I want you to look at them as I just talked briefly about them and you can see that the, the lines look very very different don't they the top left here random fluctuation the whatever it is we're measuring is going up and down quite a lot each month but that's how the system is behaving now so that all of that data represents the baseline the fact that it's very variable is you need to know that the top right here the linear trend showing variation is a very different kind each month a strong linear trend it's not a perfect straight line but it's almost a straight line if that's your baseline where do you think it's going to go the following year if nothing changes yeah you're right it's going to carry on growing what about the final one this bottom one here the seasonal dip some of our data contains that seasonality our performance year it's another and that is predictable you need to know that too. So your baseline could be any one of those three or any other possibility, but you need to know what it is. Three of these cases, one month, what that is doing, you need more than that. And if you're thinking about patient experience stage obviously there are a number of ways you can do that you could interview you can survey questionnaire people and you can obviously go and track patients that's collecting data too so our pause points is here and here's the question for you to think about and take two or three minutes on this what outcome measure is related to your aim and what process link to those these were based on your potential changes also the first type of chart we've come across already and that's the pareto chart use this to record the number of times distinct things happen such as reasons that patients are cancelled and so on the next type of graph you will use you will use to help you um, again as a bar chart but this time you're using it to feed back the results of survey data so here you can see on the graph that we've got a statement and what we've asked uh, in this case staff to respond to was how with that statement are they strongly disagreeing disagreeing agreeing or strongly agreeing and you can see there's a neutral option too uh, and you can see that those are the responses now if you simply average those responses uh, scoring a strongly disagree with a one and a strongly agree with a five you end up with, a, with an average of four four out of five which on the face of it sounds quite good but you can see from the graph that that doesn't do justice to the responses you received 
So it's always good when you get your survey results and you've got a, a scale like that from strongly disagree to agree or strongly positive to strongly negative or any other words. Plot them out on a bar graph like this to see what the spread looks like. And do it question by question. And sometimes you will also have the raw data and you can do it for each respondent. You won't know who they are often. It's anonymous. But if you can do it respondent by respondent as well, that tells you whether a particular respondent is very, very happy or very, very unhappy, or maybe they're just in the middle all the time. So that's a very useful way of looking at your survey results. But then, of course, we're looking now, finally, for how do you look at data over time? And the way to do that is to use a time series chart, like the one we showed in the Metzler's Re Reconciliation example. But this time, this chart has an extra line on it. You can see this red line, horizontal red line, running right across the middle of the graph. And that is the median, because this is a run chart. So what do run charts look like? Well, they look just like this. We are plotting our data, in this case the little white diamond shapes, so each month's data over time. And we're plotting the median, the middle value, as a, as a line. In this case, a dotted line it doesn't have to be a dotted line on your graph. So that's the typical value. And then we're analyzing the chart by studying how the values fall around that median. So what might we look for in terms of impact? Well, before we go there, a couple of things. Run chart, does it look familiar? I suspect for those with the clinical background, it certainly will. And we use these uh, in, in this case. Uh, often with patient observations to give us an idea about what's going on. The other thing to think about is that things vary over time, just as they do with a person's normal body temperature. And here you can see a little table uh, that's in Fahrenheit, so that tells you it's an American table, where the body temperature is expressed as a range notice, irrespective of how old the patient is, or where the temperature is measured, it's always a range, the normal range. And so what we want to know with our data for that particular process we're looking at, is it behaving normally or is it not? And particularly when we're introducing a change, which we hope will be an improvement, we're wanting to jolt that typical performance out of normality and make it look different. And the key way we can do that is to separate out the signals, the improvement that we hope to have made from the noise, the normal way that that process behaves up and down over time. To separate them, we need a particular way of doing that and run charts help us because what the run chart does is say, look, if you get six points in a row above that median line, that center line, or below it, six or more, then that's an indication that you've got a shift in that process. Something has caused that process to change its normal behavior. That red line in both cases, the median, does not represent now what that process is doing. And if that happened at about the time you made your change, well, that's as good as it gets in terms of saying, we made the change here, and look what happened as a result. We made the change here, and look what happened as a result. So, some of you may quite naturally be asking, why six? Well, toss a coin, what's the chance of getting a head? And many of you will say 50-50, and you'd be right. That could also be expressed as one chance in two. There are two possibilities when you toss a coin, a head and a tail, and we want the head. I've got a one in two chance. But what if you toss the coin twice? 
what's the chance of getting two heads in a row? At this point, some people, most people actually, when I ask that question, go silent. They're thinking, ah, oh, it's a bit more difficult. So here's the first question. Is it, do you think it's going to be more difficult to get two in a row, as difficult or easier? Yep, it's more difficult. It's twice as difficult, actually. You've got one chance in four of getting two heads in a row. And I'll let you, if you're interested, thinking what the other three possibilities are. Well, let's roll that forward. What about six? Well, that's like tossing a coin six times and getting six heads in a row. What's the chance of that? Pretty slim. So we're saying six is good enough. We're happy to accept that six represents something that's worth looking into. We really think this has caused a change in my process. There are a number of other rules that you can use with a run chart, and there's a reference at the end of this uh, webinar that you can get hold of and, and read them. But that's the key one for improvement, six or more in a row. And what we want our chart to tell us is this. We want to know what it was like before we made the changes. And our medicine's reconciliation, those first six months, represented the baseline position for them. We want to know what's happening to our data during the time we are making our changes. And that's the, the, the mm -hmm. right-hand side of that graph there. And then something we don't really see in this graph, we want to know what's happening after our changes are in place. Are we sustaining any gains we have made. So we're almost done now, um, but we do need to come to one final thing before I finish, and that's testing and implementing that PDSA. So let's think about that. Plan, do, study, act. Plan what to do and predict the effect. Carry out, that's the plan bit. Do is carry out the plan as documented. So when you're doing, you've got to do the plan, which may sound obvious. You can't deviate. And then you study. Compare what actually happened with what you thought would happen. And then act accordingly. Do we need to adopt this? It works so well, it's going to work. Do we need to abandon it? It's so rubbish that we're going to have to start again. Or actually, and this is the most common option, adapt. We change it slightly, we tweak it, and try it again. So how big a test are we talking about when we say we plan to do something and carry out the plan? Well, the test is very small to start off with. We're talking one patient. The smallest test you can do to start with, but don't stop there. If it works well for one, try it with a few more and a few more until you hit a problem. Then go. you keep going around the cycle, you get to act, and you say, do I need to adapt it? Yes, I do, because it doesn't work now. It worked fine at the weekdays. It doesn't work so well at weekends. Or it worked fine on the day shift. It doesn't work on the night shift. Or it worked fine for this group of patients. It doesn't work quite so well for that group of patients. And you keep going. And as you test, you learn and you adapt, increasing your degree of belief and others that this change will work. Remember, there are people who are working with you who don't have your degree of enthusiasm about change, about this change working at all. You're testing ideas under different conditions. You're reducing resistance. You're asking people to try something, perhaps once rather than this is the way it's going to be. And it is actually quicker to implement because you get to the issues and you get to, to, to adapt against those issues much earlier in the process. So, next steps is go back to your aim. Does it describe an outcome or not a solution? Are you using plain English, no weasel words? What about a target, a goal that you want to achieve? Is that there? Your diagnosis, do we understand enough to suggest some sensible changes? What diagnostic tools can we use? And I've given you three today, five whys, Pareto and process mapping. And have we got a reasonable driver diagram? 
or a, a reasonable theory about how our system works. Once we've done that, it's down to measures. There's a lot to think about there. So here's a new another slide which takes you through those six, seven steps. Clear on the aim. Have you chosen the most appropriate measures for that aim and for the solutions that you intend to use? Can you describe them simply enough so that everybody understands what we are talking about? Remember, what's a for? And are you sure you can get the data? How do you know? Have you tested it? What chart are you going to use to display your data? You've got a choice of two here, bar charts and line charts. I've made it simple for you. Who will be using them at step six, which we haven't really talked about today? Who will be using them to make your decisions? And finally, some references. There's a book behind the model called The Improvement Guide. There's more, a little bit more. It's a 10 minute video on YouTube about seven steps to measurement. So you can try that as a little refresher. And there's a basic uh, reference for the run chart in the BMJ Quality and Safety by Perla, Provost and Murray. So that's it from me. I hope you've uh, enjoyed listening and interacting with this webinar. And I wish you every success with your improvement.